Good day, everyone. My name is Srikanth Acharya, and I'm the CTO of Excel 4. And today's topic, of course, is software defined vehicle. It's now almost become a cliche at this point. And the, the standardization efforts undertaken by both Red Hat and Excel 4 in the form of eSync and other associated uh, standards that are encompassing the whole sphere of software defined vehicle. And of course, the common theme is the OpenShift hybrid platform of Red Hat, which allows you to connect to any cloud provider with ease. With that said, let me come to my introduction. So a quick one. So Excel 4 has been driving standardization, both for cloud to the vehicle and from inside the vehicle as well. So this was the standardization that started to standardize data and OTA, which is very key if SDV has to become a real, uh, what I call fountain of, of monetization for the car industry. So we are just a quick introduction. We have five offices worldwide. We have global adoption for the easing standardization across OEMs. And of course, we have a considerable amount of what I call established uh, vehicles on the road. Now, just a quick note on what Async e really means. The Async e is a bidirectional standardized pipeline. And it's a client, server client, and agent approach. It's not new to the what I call industrial, industrialized world. And the, the beauty of this distributed architecture is allow you to scale. You don't have, and then the, the scaling comes in the form of it doesn't matter how many devices are connected in the network the client discovers them and brings them into the network. This allows scalability. Secondly, the server to client connectivity is not going to change from platform to platform. And so in that context, you create, you only change a, the aspects of the system that need to change from when you move from say one car platform to the next. It addresses all major OSs, so that's not a problem. It is basically transparent to the connectivity scheme. So any network can be connected. It has global requirements. And of course, it has full logs and records for compliance. So that's very important because that's one of the important things for certification today. Now, what's inside the, the what I call the client agent architecture? The agent is a software abstraction, a software abstraction that allows you to present a device in a very standardized interface that connects to a message broker. So whenever a new device comes in, it presents its credentials, the credentials are verified, and if it's the right one, it becomes registered. So this is what is known as a discovery mechanism. In this way, what happens is the agents get discovered as the system powers up. So the system does not have a predefined memory as to how much, how many devices are in the network at any given time. What it does is as the power comes on, the various registrations get matched, tallied, and the network gets discovered. There are two reasons why this is becomes a very important thing. One is, first of all, any new element that gets introduced as a rogue element can get, be discovered immediately. And if some devices are non-operational, gets flagged immediately. So, and if there are, if the same setup is put on a uh, car that has 20 ECUs, or a car with 40 ECUs, or 100 ECUs, the discovery allows the system to stay standard across platforms. Now, the standardization event effort is not an easy effort at any point, but it has gathered momentum. It has gathered momentum in terms of customers, OEMs, and even semiconductor companies. And that has really been a driving force because finally standardization has to come from within the organization. It cannot be imposed. Standardizations have to be something that you learn from mistakes. But standardization cannot be what I call an insular. It has to go across standard because there's so many other bodies that are also doing stuff. This whole SDV is such a big swath that you cannot attempt to solve it with one uh, organization. So you have to collaborate. And in this regard, you have 
the Covisa. Covisa is building this, what I call the standardized vehicle catalog in the cloud. And so uh, the Sync Alliance went into an Alliance agreement in 2021, created the, the specification, or I call organization between the CVII, the Connected Vehicle Initiative, as well as the vehicle uh, catalog that they are trying to build. So these are all the activities, joint technical sessions and demonstrate proof of concepts. There's another standards organization that is evolving called the AutoWare Foundation that presents what I call creating an open source for the autonomous driving pipeline. So now we have worked with them for over six months to bring in concepts that can allow this kind of uh, what I call containerized updates into their autonomous vehicles. And this is again an important, what I call development. So standardization cannot be insular. It has to grow beyond its own boundaries and it has to collaborate because the whole area of the vehicle development is not a, a preserve of one single uh, organization or company. Now, in this standardized pipeline, you have the OTA, which is the ODR update, but that is not what I call all in all. You have to bring data out of the vehicle in order to have this learning loop. So we talk about autonomous driving vehicles. How do they become better? You have to have a learning loop. And for that, that is the EDIX data, data management aspect. So you always have to figure out how things can grow from a structure that is what I call the infrastructure. And the infrastructure is the standardized pipeline. And then it exposes very standardized interfaces through APIs that are well-defined in the standard, standard definition that's available in the async client, to the async client members. It's a 500 page spec that outlines every aspect of how to make the server available, how to create the client, how to create the agent, and also to create what I call substantially the next aspects of, of uh, evolution, which is the data and then the analytics. So by creating these what I call common interfaces that are look like what I call microservices, you can bring in these uh, services into the eSync pipeline. And so deep data, uh, how to extract, the full resolution, having rolling buffers, all these become part of the construct that create the eDatix pipeline that connects to the eSync OTS scheme. Now, what happens with the data aggregation platform? You have to have both the cloud aspect and the, the in-vehicle aspect. So much data is getting uh, collected inside the vehicle to transfer all the data into the cloud is, I would say, not a, I wouldn't call it feasible. It is feasible, but it's not practical. So you have to have cleans the data. The cleansing the data inside the vehicle is extremely important before you transfer that cleans data back into the cloud because that's what is relevant. Relevant data that is in and around an event. Relevant data that extracts certain features out of what's happening. That to me is essential to the, the platform approach itself. So. You have the eSync pipeline, then you have the eSync OT as an application, and now you have the eDatix as an application. Now you have the complete learning loop for the vehicle. And these are all coming out of standardization processes. Now, so it, we have implemented a version of the eDatix, and these are all the things that we have managed to get out of it. So telematics data for the vehicle that is generally available and everybody knows how to do it. Then talk about different, what I call uh, device statuses inside the vehicle. You're talking about uh, what I call dashboards that tell us a little more detail about power and drivetrain, uh, battery management systems, and high resolution data on demand. Now, these are all configurable. So you can send the configuration information from the cloud and the appropriate data shows up from, from the uh, device it through the client into the cloud. Now coming to the whole aspect of the software defined vehicle. Now the software defined vehicle is, can mean several things to the, the people who work on it. Here is our definition of what a software defined vehicle is. The key things are 
you have to have a stand standardized hardware that rolls out of a platform because you are trying to put software that is configured to create the car. So what is that? It needs to have a domain master architecture. You have to have zonal controllers. And these are uh, they're what I call a confluence of high compute uh, centralized units to what I call regional zonal compute units. So now, once the hardware is standardized, you can now deploy the software to create the feature or the vehicle. So in that regard, now you can put model, you can create some models, you can create options, packages, personalizations, but it all emanates from a standard, having a standard hardware platform on the table. So now a lot of things are happening, you know, features on demand, uh, feature purchases, subscriptions, rentals, refreshes, upgrades, have become part of a personalization, personalization process. We are all in this age of having cell phones getting updated, new cell phones coming along. We are all used to it. Now we are trying to bring the same into the car. And you don't have to sell it anymore because this is something that we have gone used to it. Similarly, now that you have pushed features on, what do you do in terms of getting data out of the vehicle? So what all the things that you can create to monetize their vehicle data. Now, that's important that you need to get standardized data out of the vehicle in order to even monetize it. So you have to go beyond test vehicles. So in olden days, you had to run vehicles on test tracks to get data before a vehicle is launched. But today, you cannot. You don't have that. You don't need to have that because you have hundreds and thousands of vehicles running on everyday use cases, and you're going to collect data out of them. While you may need still the, the uh, racetracks or the test tracks are going to be relevant. But the reality is that by connecting the vehicles, all of them, you are getting hundreds and thousands of vehicle data all at once, giving you a better understanding as to how the vehicle is performing in different use cases. So you can bring in predictive analytics, predict life cycles, remedials, event correlations, even assess as to the state of the road. Challenge in a software-defined vehicle and the complexity of its connections. This is the challenge. We talk a lot about standardization, talk about the ways you can monetize data, but we fundamentally are grounded in our own legacy that we are managing. And that's somehow we are unable to get out of it. Why? This is the challenge we have in the modern, um, what I call, uh, landscape of OEMs. You have OEMs on one end, you have Tier ones on the other end, they all make ECUs, but they each make a different version of the device to reflect the needs of their OEMs. So look at how much cost that entails, how much energy that is. And this is what we all want to do is to standardize, is if we get ECUs to present a standardized interface and they are tested, validated, and say they are e-sync ready or whatever standardized ready, then even the OEMs don't have to wonder how they want to integrate that vehicle, that device ECU into their structure. In order to simplify, you have to standardize. In order to reduce costs, you got to standardize. In order to monetize, you got to standardize. And this is the challenge for all of us. Interoperability is part of the spec. The compliance, conforms, conformations, the, there are minimal requirements, of course, and there are APIs. We have also what I call, we understand that OEMs have had their own, um, what I call, investments. So this standard allows you to how to gracefully merge the two so that you can use the, the scalability and, and ease of uh, deployment to trying to merge with existing infrastructure. Market engagement adoption. So we have leading partnerships, of course, Red Hat being one of the key ones. The alliance is building, building, bringing in a lot of value. And of course, we have managed to create a common interface to the cloud platforms. Use cases. This is a use case of a autonomous driving truck platform that is using eSync today. It got it running in literally three months into their beta. Now, this concept of trying to get things into production is always a headache for automotive OEMs. But the standardized modular structure of eSync allows you to get going into your production quickly. 
the, there's a new uh, upcoming uh, member in the alliance that is really creating a platform that we thought would be the prototype of a software defined vehicle. What are they doing? They are creating a super board that presents the drivetrain, the battery, the steering, all these available as a platform. And you can put the skin on top and create your own vehicle. That's a, that would have been a great concept to start with, but this is reality today. And so that's U Power for you. It's a multimodal EV platform. Now, a little bit about OpenShift integration. Everything is a collaboration and an effort to figure out how these things can work together. And what we have done in, in this whole process of two years of working with Red Hat is figuring out ways that the various modules can talk to each other and become part of, of a connectivity environment. And so the open shift to us has been a great experience. And right now I'd like to forward or hand over my talk to my colleague, Ortwin, who can expound on what all he has been doing with eSync and the OpenShift and the environment that he has created. Thank you, Srikant. So then let me, can you hear me by the way? Every yes. sound is working? Great. Sure. And um, I would need to share my screen. Do I have to leave now to let you share the screen? No, or you can do it yourself. It, it should work now. Okay. All right. Try this. And you should see my screen. Yes, we can. So you see my screen, right? Yep. OK, great. Um, so yeah, first, let me um, briefly introduce myself. So my name is Odwin Schneider. I'm working in the hybrid platforms uh, OpenShift business unit um, at Red Hat. And yeah, today um, I want to um, show you a little demo um, and also talk a little bit uh, about what we have done with uh, eSync together in this context of the demo you heard al uh, already with the human driving perception platform uh, with Bobby Carr. But um, first of all, thank you, Srikant, uh, for, for covering this topic and is explaining kind of the, the over there architecture and so on and now the, I, I would start with a question okay now from a Reddit perspective how can we help with uh, with this uh, over the air update topic so how can we help with our technologies and i would say basically it is like this um e-sync kind of standardize um the the way uh, or over the air updates so that's not um that not every vendor kind of in, in, invent the wheel um, again and again. And what we do from the Red Hat side, we kind of standardize the platform. So we not only have Kubernetes, we have um, a lot a lot more services added on top of it. So like we have platform services, application services, data, developer services, and there's a bunch of other um, services as well, like multi-cluster management, security, all the things you need for two things. So you can run it and complete Async over the air um, infrastructure at scale in a cloud agnostic fashion. So, as also mentioned in the upstream um, um, talk we heard, uh, it is like um, cloud agnostic. We have operators, they can replace the managed services you have, and you can kind of run your Async um, over the air infrastructure in any cloud, if it's AWS, Azure, wh wherever in your own data center. So, you have kind of really a consistent environment to run these services um, really at scale. And some of the things, for example, the eSync uh, consists of, uh, the architecture consists of several components. So there is a server component actually, where you kind of manage your software packages, you create updating uh, campaigns and so on. And the, the server infrastructure needs several middleware components as well. And we can also provide uh, uh, on, on top of OpenShift with uh, some of our application services portfolio, for example, with API management, with messaging platforms, database, caching. So all these services, we can use them to actually support the actual eSync infrastructure. So what we what you could do is you can really operate an over-the-air infrastructure with, with uh, on top of OpenShift. This is one thing. And the other thing, you can use the OpenShift container platform um, to really build your automotive uh, cloud for all the other types of workloads uh, in this scenario, as all already heard today. So we have machine learning, AI. So OpenShift is really um, for any type of workload, right? So you can do your machine learning AI, 
stream data processing, batch processing. It is it supports microservice architecture, event-based architecture, and so on. These are also very re relevant in this context. So, but let me come to the demo part. Um, so as already heard, um, we've created a demo um, which is called Bobby Car. Basically, what it is, it is kind of an opinionated design, a Red Hat recommendation, you could say, for a cloud, no cloud native IoT architecture built with Red Hat products. So there are a lot of kind of reference architectures out there um, supporting these different type of workloads. And this is kind of an, a way we, we would um, recommend you could do it with OpenShift and a bunch of the, the middleware um, portfolio we have. So... <clears throat> Uh, the high level architecture just to give you the context of this demo um so just walk over the high level architectures so basically it is a vehicle simulation so we have uh, on the left side the actual bobby cars um which are vehicle simulators implemented in cloud native java and quarkus by the way everything you see here is is running in openshift so um and then we have um several regional cloud environments and a central cloud environment. And so there is the connectivity from the uh, simulated vehicles um, to the um, central cloud environment with MQTT, with an uh, HTTP Kafka bridge, and so on. So basically, all the data coming from the cars, um, all the telemetry data, they're coming to the MQTT. And then we have several integration components, cloud native integration components. Um, and basically everything that comes in goes into Kafka. And from there, we distribute the data or do different types of processing. So one thing is, of course, um, real-time data processing with Kafka streams for, or Apache Spark, so the different um, technologies you could use there. Um, then we have distributed caching as well to kind of store the current state um, of every car uh, in, in the system where we have um, business entities and configurations stored in there. There is a uh, real-time dashboard to see, okay, where are the cars driving? What, what is happening there? Um, and then we mirror the data. We do also some data cleansing, so to say, and um, mirror all the relevant data for machine learning from the regional cloud environments to central cloud environments. And you see there on the right side, there is a central Kafka um, um, cluster running. And attached to this cluster, there's, uh, for example, um, our machine learning infrastructure, which could be from a Red Hat perspective uh, based on Open Data Hub. And there you do your machine learning and bring the trained models back uh, up into the, uh, into the car. So this is basically the high level architecture of, of the demo. And now um, what we've done in, in the last few months is also uh, integrate a use case with eSync with a standard over the air updates for this uh, specific demo. So what we have is we've deployed eSync servers in this regional cloud environments. And the eSync client is kind of the in-vehicle gateway communicating with the server side. So whenever there is an update for a specific type of car and so on, um, the, the client will fetch the data, the actual um, payload, and will uh, distribute it internally to the specific ECU and will do the update. But in this scenario here, um, the, the vehicle simulations, they're not highly sophisticated, so we don't simulate like ECUs, things like this. This is just more uh, the use case we've uh, implemented here is uh, kind of a location-based configuration change. So we have our vehicles, they're driving around, and we have uh, configured different zones. That could be, for example, environmental zones, or it could be a, a zone in a specific, a specific area where we want to react on, on certain conditions, like there is um, kind of the, the, um, the road conditions are, are different, and when we want to apply um, a different um, configuration to the car for a specific location. So this is kind of the use case. And so we have the simulated cars. So they're driving, sending telemetry data, uh, telemetry data to the cloud backend over MQTT, MQ streams. So this is kind of a simplified view you see here. Then there is also um, a zone change detection service uh, running. So whenever um, there, a car enters a zone or leaves a zone, there will be a zone change event emitted. And then we use OpenShift serverless, which is also one of the services um, OpenShift offers. And we use the serverless um, function 
to kind of um, communicate with eSync server to check, okay, is this uh, is this an update zone? Is this car um, kind of valid for an update? And then we assign kind of the vehicle identification number to a specific um, update campaign. So we um, interacting with the API server of the eSync, and this one this one will then trigger the assigned um, eSync client the the actual over the update download. So it, the client will download the update package and will distribute it to the car and will be applied there. So this is kind of the context and just a demo we've, we've um, um, implemented here. And I would now jump into the demo part in OpenShift, but I have to, um, <laughs> I have to apologize today. So something really bad happened. Um, actually, I completely destroyed my OpenShift cluster. So I don't have an over the update infrastructure, eSync, whatever. So I've spent, I've used a new OpenShift cluster and I only can show you, unfortunately, only a few parts of it. So basically just the Bobby car components and, and the cars, but um, I wasn't able to kind of um, reproduce the complete over the uh, eSync um, parts of this demo. So I'm really sorry for this. This is one of the worst days in, in years for me. But um, yeah, honestly, it's it's the okay. case. So what, what you see here, we are here in an OpenShift environment 4.10. And there is a project uh, called Bobby Car. I switch into this project and also jump into the developer perspective. And then you should see some circles and bubbles popping up. And you see all the containers running here. So basically, what you see here is um, is the complete um, regional IoT cloud, cloud environment with a caching system, with uh, Kafka running here, MQTT broker, several integration components, and so on. So everything is deployed in here. And you, you'll find all the code also in GitHub. So you can also, if you want to try that um, in your OpenShift environment. So everything is running here. And now let's zoom in. You see here uh, is a car simulator. This is the actual Bobby car, our vehicle. So there's one container currently running, and this one is simulating 20 cars. And there is also a dashboard component, which is kind of the actual visual side of it. So we have a dashboard, and there's basically very simple. There's just a map, and we see the 20 cars now. So we should see a map, and we should also see some markers moving around. And the red circles you see here, these are the specific update zones. So there is, for example, in Frankfurt, we have a zone. Then here is a zone um, in this um, intersection here in front of the airport and so on. So we can have different zones and configure them. So one thing we can do, we could, for example, create new zones and uh, move them around and configure them for specific types of, of uh, updates, for example. We could do some real-time query of the data if we move like this gray search area and we want to know, okay, now um, kind of a little bit of stream analytics, what is the average speed, carbon dioxide emission and so on of the cars driving here. We could do things like this. And um, also, so the, the thing is now, if a car enters um, a specific zone, so we are not that happy because the cars are driving somewhere else around, but if they enter a zone, um, this will um, trigger the serverless function in, in, in the background, and this will assign the car to the over the update server and will trigger the actual download. So we could normally, if it would work, um, we could go to the car detail, select one specific car. Um, yeah, we can also switch the cockpit view. If there is street view data available, we see, okay, the car is currently driving here and we see the data here. And there is kind of a um, heads up display where we see, okay, what type of car, what is the vehicle number and so on. And we see this car is uh, driving in a default zone. And as soon as there is a zone change event, we, you see also this one is popping up here. Um, by the way, you see also some of the uh, data here with the current speed and so on. And then we could also query the current engine config. And this is kind of the, the gear behaviors where we took like a configuration from a real world car. And this is um, the actual payload um, where we have a different um, engine behavior for specific zones. So that would be this JSON would come through the eSync over the air update normally. So basically, but you get the idea how this works and how we use it in this specific scenario and integrate it also with a lot of the, the um, technologies from our side. And yeah, basically that's it from my side and yeah. So Ortwin, um, don't worry, live demos 
always fail at some point. Um, I know. It just proves, <laughs> proves the, the elasticity of our um, adaptable speakers. And thank you very much for that.